The next contribution is from West Virginia University. Ed Kugler. His co authors are Todd Gardner and Yujai Hanfor Panos. Uh, the title of this talk is Hydrothermal Deactivation Kinetics of FCC Catalyst with USY Zeolite. Ed got his start with at Hudson <coughs> College. Um, from there, he went to uh, got his PhD from John Hopkins University. Uh, he has quite the varied uh, professional experience, uh, being in uh, private, uh, public, and now at academic institution. But started with Exxon Research and Engineering. From there, he went to the Department of Energy, and now he's at West Virginia. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning, and it's nice to be in this section on uh, FCC catalysts. My, uh, my interest in deactivation of FCC catalysts goes back to my work with Exxon. And clearly there are, there are physical changes that take, were taking place. Uh, Ross was talking about some of those this morning. Uh, in evaluating an FCC catalyst, what we typically do is hydrothermally deactivate it first. There are a couple reasons for this. Uh, one is that it mimics the environment that the catalyst sees in a commercial FCC unit. Uh, the, the second is that the steaming also brings about physical changes and catalytic changes. And if you look at cracking real feeds on an unsteamed catalyst, you typically make a lot of coke. And that if it's fresh catalyst, you might make 10% coke. If you steam the catalyst for as little as an hour, your coke make will drop to about 2%. And uh, with the drop in coke make, you also have an increase in gasoline yield. So all of these are, are very favorable. Uh, from a refining standpoint, and a lot of this is probably related to what Ross was saying this morning with regard to the loss of the very high active sites, uh, which are giving you hydrogen transfer reactions and are also giving you coke making uh, reactions. Now, my interest in, in steaming uh, stems from some old curiosity. Uh, when I used to steam catalysts, I would steam them at 1350F for. Uh, 16 hours. And the reason for the 16 hours was this was convenient. And we worked one shift, you steam catalyst overnight. But if you looked around, you discovered that everyone else had different procedures. Uh, our Baton Rouge laboratory steamed them for 1400F overnight. Uh, you talked to Davison, they steamed them for five hours, and that's because they ran two or three shifts and you wanted to get the job done uh, in one shift, and they steamed at a higher temperature. <coughs> So, so my curiosity was based primarily on what's happening to these materials uh, when the steaming is taking place. So uh, in order to uh, try to deal with, uh, with this curiosity problem, uh, I've, I've used a couple of master's students at WVU. Uh, Todd Gardner was a part-time student with DOE in uh, in Morgantown, is the first student to work on the problem, and Jung Jai Pampernod is uh, the current student uh, who's looking at the same problem. And what we wanted to do is describe the hydrothermal aging of zeolite-based FCC catalysts. And the approach that we're using is very simple. Uh, what we want to do is we want to control the processing conditions. We want to control time, temperature, steam partial pressure. And we want to make some fairly simple measurements on this. And we've chosen to uh, monitor the physical changes that are taking place by the surface area characteristics. 
and then we measure the BET surface area in order to get micropore area and the external surface of the catalyst, and then we do a T-plot calculation in order to get the external surface area alone. And then if we want to get the contribution from the zeolite, all we have to do is look at the difference in, uh, in these two values. We've, uh, we've done testing on, uh, on two catalysts. Uh, both of these are Davison catalysts. The first catalyst we work with is an octocat. Uh, it contains about 40% of the hydrogen exchange USY zeolite. Uh, about 90% of it is going to be kaolin clay, which is a filler, and then the remaining uh, portion is a silica sol binder. We've uh, compared this with uh, in our current work uh, with what Davison calls a GO40. Uh, this is about 40% of a rare earth exchange USY, uh, also with uh, the balance being the kaolin clay and the binder. So what we see in going from one catalyst to the other is in the first case we're using a traditional uh, hydrogen exchange USY and then we're going to a rare earth exchange uh, USY. The apparatus is very simple. Uh, we have an airflow. We control the rate with mass flow controllers. Uh, we have our water flow. We, we pump uh, liquid water with an HPLC pump. We mix air and water in a nebulizer. It's heated to 450 centigrade. We then run uh, steam nominally at this temperature uh, into our furnace where we have a small fluidized bed. Uh, the thermocouple is near the top. The catalyst is near the top. Uh, we add fresh catalysts from the top. We have a valve at the bottom, and we want to withdraw catalysts. We turn our valve at the bottom. Our flow direction changes. It goes Instead of going up, it goes down. The catalyst drops, and we simply, we simply drop it into uh, a beaker and we're ready uh, to, make, uh, to make further measurements. At one time, I photographed uh, the glassware, and this is under cold conditions. The, uh, you can see our change in diameters. The idea is to be able to fluidize over a large range of fluidization velocities. Uh, typically, it would be about 500 cc's STP per minute, uh, be two or three times that in actual velocity. Uh, you can see our catalyst is sitting here. I'm sorry, here's the top of it. Okay, here's the bottom. So it's all captured in this area where we're having our change in diameter. And in fact, this is a spouting bed rather than uh, rather than a fluidized bed, but. The idea was to get good contacting between gas and solids, not uh, to be particularly concerned as to whether this is an ideal fluid bed or not. Okay. If we look at the physical measurements on our surface area adsorption, this is typical for a zeolite catalyst. We have the micropores and the zeolite. They fill first. This is nitrogen adsorption. Okay. As the pressure increases, we get our, our bend. And then we get a long uh, tail as we build, start to build up multi-layers on the catalyst surface. We measure the BET surface area in this particular range. We run up to fairly high pressure, up to about 450 torr, in order to get good values for our T-plot. And that you don't want to extrapolate data from too small uh, a region. Uh, so we, we uh, collect data for a long period of time over a wide uh, pressure range. The difficulty with doing BET surface areas is that you could pretty much get any value you want, depending upon what pressure range you choose uh, for your measurements. So we had to establish some criteria so we didn't cheat. And the criteria we use is that we have a linear portion of the plot. 
This is typically in the range from about 0.01 to about 0.065 uh, relative pressure. And we have the additional constraint that this intercept has to be positive. There, there's, there's no uh, justification for a negative intercept in the BET theory. So that if, you're, uh, if you get a negative intercept, you're over the wrong pressure range. As we increase the pressure range, we'll get curvature, it will go in this direction. The tendency would be to get the negative intercept. So we, we look for at least the 4-9 correlation coefficient and the additional constraint that we have a positive intercept on, uh, uh, on the BET plot. This is a typical T plot uh, for a zeolite uh, catalyst. The constraint on a T plot is that you're looking for a linear portion. You want to be able to extrapolate the linear portion to zero film thickness. The intercept corresponds to the amount of gas that is absorbed in micropores. So when we're looking at this curvature here, okay, we might be able to find a linear portion, but our intercept is negative. Negative intercepts, again, are bad. So we typically look at film thicknesses from about four and a half uh, up to our maximum, which is just a little bit less than, uh, than eight angstrom film thickness. Again, we typically get a good correlation of our data points, and we're able to evaluate uh, the surface area that's external to the pores. Okay, if we start uh, looking at data, this is our hydrogen USY. Uh, Zeolite, we're looking at the total BET surface area. This is a catalyst, the octocat, that has been steamed at 650 centigrade. And what we've done is we've varied uh, the amount of water uh, that's in our, uh, in our fluidizing gas, where it says air, this is dry air. Shows a rapid fall off in surface area and then nearly constant after that. If we introduce water vapor, we go to 20% water vapor, we get a much larger fall off. We go to 100% water vapor, uh, we get an even greater loss in surface area. And this is typical of what we'll see with a zeolite catalyst. As we introduce our water vapor, we go from dry air to, uh, to moist air. We have a very large uh, change in the surface area. Now what we've been interested in doing is to try to model these changes. The lines that are drawn are the lines that are predicted uh, by the model that we use, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. If I just look at the zeolite surface area, this is going to be the difference between uh, the BET surface area and the T-plot area. I look at the same data. This is the catalyst in dry air. Uh, we're showing a very slight slope. I would be tempted to draw a straight line there, but uh, there, there's clearly uh, just small changes, even smaller changes. Uh, when we look at the zeolite surface area alone as compared to the total surface area, so it appears that we must be having some change in the matrix. Uh, even in the dry air. Uh, again, uh, we have fall off in the data. We have, in some cases, a little bit more scatter uh, in this data than we had, uh, than we had previously. Uh, we don't have a particularly good fit for our 20% water vapor line. We have a much better fit at the higher water vapor levels, uh, particularly down here at 100% uh, steam. So the lower temperature that we've studied with, uh, with this particular catalyst is at 650 centigrade. The other extreme in our studies is at 800 centigrade. We have other data in between, but you get tired of looking at the same curves over and over again. So we'll try to keep this to a minimum. Uh, if we look at the data at 800, we see that we have a good fit and our changes in total surface area uh, for dry air. 
Uh, we introduce steam, we see similar effects as before. Again, we can fit the data pretty well at 20, 40, 60, 80, and 100% steam. Uh, our time measurements, it doesn't show up so well, are from, from uh, one to 24 hours of steam treatment. If we look at total magnitude, as we go to higher temperatures, we get larger losses in surface area. Uh, at 650, we were somewhere around 220 meters squared for 100% steam. When we go to 800, we're down to about 180 meters squared for 100% steam. So the higher, the higher temperature, the more severe uh, of the steaming condition, uh, the greater the changes. Uh, we see. Again, we find that we have a satisfactory fit uh, between the model and the experimental data. Lastly, this is uh, changes in zeolite surface area alone. You remember with uh, at 650, we had nearly a straight line going across with, uh, with very little change. This would be the, the starting condition no treatment, and we had nearly the straight line at the no treatment condition at 650. We see that when we get to 800, we're doing things to the zeolite surface area, okay, even with dry air, uh, that the changes are rapid in the first few hours of measurement. This is one hour, this is three hours, this is six hours, and then there's not too much changing. Uh, after six hours, and we're gradual decrease. When we go to steam, these effects are magnified. And again, uh, the more steam, the more severe the effect. So if we just look at the conclusions on this part of the work, and this first part was Todd Gardner's work, we look at Todd's conclusions. He found a mathematical expression that is used for sintering ceramics. Uh, he found that the same expression fit well for the changes in surface area uh, with, the, with the FCC catalyst, where S0 is the initial surface area, uh, S is the surface area that's measured, uh, N sub S is a constant, K sub S0 is, a, is another constant or a pre-exponential factor, if you will. He's measured an experimental surface area, Okay, everything else is standard. Here's our gas constant so that we can get our energy units, get this term to be dimensionless. And T is, uh, is time. Okay. Uh, in, in looking at the values of the constants, Todd uh, calculated a value for the pre-exponential factor. He calculated a value for the uh, activation energy. And then our N sub S constant, he wanted to try to include the vapor pressure of the water uh, in this constant, and he's developed a, a rather awkward expression, um, but, uh, but an expression indeed. If, uh, he looked at just the changes in the zeolite surface area as opposed to the BET surface area. Uh, a different activation energy, a different pre-exponential factor, and the values for N sub S that again were fairly similar to the preceding case. And he points out that the air alone caused only small changes, that when we introduce steam, we have, have the larger changes. So we've now moved to work with uh, the Rare Earth Exchange, USY Zeolite. This is work that is in progress and is incomplete at this time. What we find is that the Rare Earth Exchange USY seems to be more stable hydrothermally than the hydrogen USY. Our data fit is not yet satisfactory. And we're uh, still in the process of collecting data points. We have over 100 data points. We still need uh, more in order to get uh, 
get good fits. Uh, what, I, what I'll show you is some experimental data. This is on total surface area compared to curves generated for, uh, for some of Todd's models. So the lines are curves generated on Todd's model. These are experimental data points where we're seeing very little change in total surface area uh, with time at, uh, under dry conditions. We come to 100% steam. Again, after the initial rapid fall off, uh, we're seeing fairly small changes with time. This is for the catalyst at 750 degrees. And using Todd's model, we would have predict something a little bit more severe. So that we're uh, seeing what we think is a little bit better hydrothermal stability with the rare earth exchange material than with the hydrogen exchange material. If, if we look at uh, pardon me, the T-plot data, there was a question raised earlier about the uh, development of mesopores uh, in zeolites with, uh, with steaming. Uh, that, that may be the case, but if we look at the total T-plot area, we find that that decreases with severity. So if, if, if we're developing mesopores in the zeolites, there are other changes that are taking place in the overall catalyst uh, that are masking, uh, masking this. So this is, the bottom line is that our most severe steaming and that we find that the external surface area drops from initially around 35 meters squared per gram to something in uh, the, the 22 to 25 meters squared per gram uh, range and remains fairly constant with time as severity has increased. Uh, when we were at a slightly higher temperature, we have a slightly higher value. You can see that there's a lot of scatter in this particular uh, data at 700 uh, C, but the, 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 the overall loss in surface area, external surface area, is less than uh, at 750. So the summary of our work at this point is that our data for the hydrogen exchange to SY catalyst shows a good fit with model. Uh, we're, we're pleased to be able to use a model that has been used for changes in surface area before with ceramic materials with regard to centering uh, of ceramic materials. Our data with the rare earth USY is still incomplete. And the goal that I have for this work is I would like to be able to describe uh, hydrothermal deactivation of FCC catalysts with two or three constants. And I suspect that we'll find constants that will be particular that will be characteristic of a particular catalyst. So I'm, I'm hoping that we'll get to the point where we'll be able to say, well, an octocat catalyst that's described by these constants, okay. We go to a rare earth exchange of the same family, we'll be able to see that it's described by a different set of constants. And the hope is that by comparing uh, the values for these constants, that we'll have a, an idea as to these overall stability of, uh, of the materials involved. So thank you. Quick time for some questions. Uh, can you get the ultra stable Y by itself without the clay so that? Uh, yes, I, I can get that. Uh, I don't think I could fluidize it in my equipment, uh, but but yes, that would be that would be certainly something I could look at if I were going to try to to look at the development of mesopores. Uh, it also give an indication as to what synergisms might be taking place between the zeolite and, uh, and the matrix of the FCC catalyst. Following up on that, there's some work by the French in 1991. They did that work with uh, USY 
and then uh, a clay bound matrix with silica sol binder. What they found with the same USY used in both, what they found was with USY alone, with steam, it completely smashes it up. Because, and the deillumination is very severe. What they have found, and they did it also by using isotopes. And they found that the silicon can migrate from the silica sol or, or the matrix and, and, and heal this, the, the aluminums that have come out. So okay. there is a big difference between the USY and the okay. Thank you. But in USY results, when you've got the uh, water pressure pressure in this phone, does that indicate some change in mechanism? Because it's not, it's not clear that if you should have uh, water concentration in this phone, at least not to me. Okay, I don't, I don't know. surface area of the U.S. ultra stable Y. I mean, what, to what degree is it exchange? Is it 100% exchange or is it uh, partial exchange? I'm, I'm afraid I don't know the extent of the exchange that's, uh, that's in this particular catalyst. Uh, most catalyst manufacturers view this information as being proprietary. Sure. And the fact that I'm not involved with the company, I don't, uh, I don't have this information. Uh, as as to how it affects uh, the stabilization, I'll, I'll, I'll defer to Ross. Ross, do you know how how the rare earth stabilizes? Well, one of the things, uh, and again, this is this is quite uh, speculative, is that it, it, it all deals with you know which of the bonds that are being being broken: the alu oxygen, aluminum, oxygen, silicon bond. And with the rare earth, one thing we have observed is that the unit cell size remains much higher. That means you're not deilluminating, all right? So then you can then you can wonder whether it is due to the charge effects. You know, rare earth being you know a triply charged species, and you only need one rare earth for like three aluminums, and is that somehow modifying that aluminum deillumination or the aluminum oxygen bond breaking? But it is totally speculative because what we find is the unit cell size is what remains pretty stable. Yes. It, it affects the total crystallinity of the catalyst, and it, uh, zeolite is metastable. And thermodynamically, you're you're driving it toward uh, toward what molite and uh, soda glass. And soda glass, okay. And 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 the the sodium and the silicates uh, that that could be formed. So, under the temperature and the steam conditions, the zeolite degrades. And uh, you lose you lose the the structure, and it, it goes toward other materials. Well, with that, let's uh, thank again.